So then we will start. I'm just going to make a small introduction of this uh, round table to make sure that everyone can join the live event uh, during that time. So um, my name is Manon and I work for Kaun Nasechen, um, the NGO founded by Mathieu Ricard. Um, so Kauna is an NGO that acts and advocates for a more altruistic world. So I'm introducing the NGO first because I'm not sure we're live yet on both of your Facebook pages. So I, I introduce Kauna first as it's the least important one and then I'll introduce you guys. Um, so Kauna takes action mainly in India and Nepal um, in areas such as health, education, environment, food security, and economic development. And we also try to organize events to inspire and maybe encourage indiv individual action um, in topics such as um, nature and animal preservation. And so that's what this live is all about. And uh, so this event is actually co-organized with the Jane Goodall Institute France. So thank you so much also to uh, the teams of the Jane Goodall Institute who were so helpful uh, organizing this event. And so today we have the opportunity to have a conversation with both of you, Jane Goodall and Mathieu Ricard. So thank you, thank you so much for taking this time. Um, Jane, you are a pioneer in the research on animal-humans relationships since you spent several decades observing chips in, uh, chips be chimps' behavior in Tanzania. Uh, and in uh, 1977, you founded the Jane Goodall Institute to support animal preservation and their habitats. And in 2002, you were named a United Nations Messenger, messenger of Peace for your environmental and humanitarian work. And so you recently published a new book. So the book of hope that I have here, Le Livre de l'Espoir in French. And that's actually the main topic of today's exchange. Mathieu, you're a French Buddhist monk, a writer, a photographer, a scientist, and a humanitarian. Uh, in the 1970s, you left your scientific career at Institut, at Institut Pasteur to live in the Himalayas and learn and practice Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, you're the French interpreter for the Dalai Lama, as well as a renowned author and speaker on the topic of altruism. Um, so the theme of today's conversation is hope. In your book, Jane, you mentioned that hope is actually not an idle concept, but uh, rather it supposes action and commitment in order to solve the climate crisis. So therefore, it's kind of the hope of today's conversation to inspire hope to the ones listening uh, to you guys and to encourage all of us to take action. And so I'm going to start with the very first question, as we don't have much time tonight, um, regarding hope, since it's the topic. So what can we hope for in the future? And I would like to ask that to you, Jane, why you decided to write this book about hope and what are you hopeful for? Well, thank you. And um, basically, I've been writing about hope since the 1970s, I think it was when I published Reason for Hope, because even back then there were signs of things going wrong on the planet. The, you know, urgent warnings by some people that basically were not heeded about climate change and loss of biodiversity. <clears throat> and since then I've written several books with the topic of hope. There was, after the reason for hope came harvest for hope and then hope for animals and their world and then seeds of hope and this last one was planned before the pandemic began and it just so happens that it's emerging at a time when I think hope is desperately needed and according to me if we lose hope we're doomed because if you don't have hope why bother I mean you know just might as well give up if you don't think that your actions are going to be uh, making any difference or that some of the organizations out there actually are going to fail, well then don't bother. Eat, drink and be merry for tomorrow we die. So hope, what hope do I have? Well, 
I hope that we will get together in time and take the necessary action to protect this beautiful planet for future generations. Thank you, Jen. So if I may chime on, first of all, as we were saying before getting online, it's so lovely to be to give with you again, even virtually. We said we have been too long that we didn't meet in person, but uh, you have been in our hearts as you are in the hearts of so many people. So hope, yes, of course. And our mutual friend, Yann Artus Bertrand said, it's too late to be pessimistic because <laughs> if, we, if, we, if we give up hope, then what happens? You know, we sit on our bum and say, anyway, this is Armageddon coming. <laughs> it's sort of coming for sure. But if we lose hope, we don't even raise our little finger. Forget about taking major decision. I think if I may say that on the relative world, uh, one possible reason for hope is, as you said, we went through this uh, pandemic and we could see how government, to some extent, could take very drastic measures and citizens basically ready to follow probably out of fear, but also they saw the importance of it. So if just half of that determination could be put at the service of, you know, tackling the issues of climate change, then we will be somewhere <laughs> possible to actually do something. So this how to master and how to bring the same kind of motivation, determination, into the climate crisis. I spoke recently with uh, also, you know, Joan Rockstrom. He said the problem is about preoccupation number five or six of many citizens in Europe. So how to bring it really to the forefront of our preoccupation with hope and not with feeling totally depressed of, you know, what scientists tell us, which is of course true, but it seems that we are so powerless. So how to empower us to, to do something collectively, civil society, to vote, to do whatever. What would be your suggestion? And I think the short-term decision is necessary because we cannot say, like India said, we'll get out of carbon in 2070. It means nothing. By then, all the tipping points would have gone over. So what can we do now with hope and with determination in your mind? Well, you know, Matthias, the thing is that more and more people are becoming aware and although it sounds heartless to say i'm actually pleased not for the people but on for, for an overall kind of assessment of the situation it's really good that the wealthy countries are beginning to feel the bite of climate change and you know the flooding and hurricanes and typhoons in america the terrible flooding in europe because before people were saying, oh, well, this is something that affects India, Africa, Bangladesh, but it doesn't affect us. So we'll just carry on as usual. And now people are beginning to wake up and many, many more people have woken up during this pandemic and understood that we must develop a new relationship with the natural world, that we cannot go on having, considering that it's possible to have unlimited economic development on a planet with finite natural resources. It just won't work. And to think that the annual development of GDP is more important than the future of our children is crazy. And we also need a new and much more sustainable um, economic system. And we need, I don't know what you think, Madhu, but I think we need a new definition of success so that exactly yeah i mean at the moment it's wealth and power and it needs to be living a life where you can look after yourself and your family and have time to enjoy nature and the people around you what you said about success is very important because people don't like to feel that they failed so now if we only have the gdp to measure failure <laughs> then it's a, it's so you know dismaying now if we have a a social wealth, environmental wealth, like you take in account, you know, people who volunteer. You know, in France, it's 12% of the GDP, but it's not included in GDP. While drug trafficking, prostitution, and weapons 
sale is included in GDP. This is crazy. And then Bhutan evaluated that their forests standing are about 10 times the value of their annual GDP, but they leave it there. So it's this environmental wealth. So if we were seeing that the social index of well-being and the literacy and women education, every, everything that makes a, a good life and we need people to ensure that they have a good life. And we have this index of, of preservation of the environment that is would be growing instead of declining, then we'll feel success, we'll feel encouraged. And we say, okay, GDP declined, but so what? So instead of sustainable development, because development always has this suspicious idea of quantitative development. And as you said, we don't have three planets. If we speak of a, of a sustainable harmony that now we are more social justice and for the long term, we don't exhaust the renewable potential of the earth by time of August right now. So it's not sustainable and it's not harmonious in terms of harmony with nature. No, so I think, not. so yeah. we should really find success, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. But you know, there's, according to me, there are three, three problems that we have to absolutely face. And one is the unsustainable lifestyle of most of us. I include myself. Uh, and we can't all go back to being um, foragers in, in nature. We can't do that, but we can think more carefully about our own um, environmental footprint each day. I really try. And you know, one thing that's really important to do that I know you care about is moving towards a plant-based diet. Not yes. just the cruelty of the factory farms, but the terrible impact on the environment with growing the grain to feed these billions of poor animals, all the fossil fuel that's used to get the grain to the animals, the animals to slaughter and the meat to the table, the water that's used to change vegetable to animal protein, the fact that they're all producing methane gas, which is, a, as you know, a very virulent greenhouse gas. And uh, so, you know, it, it, it's really important that more and more and more people begin to move to a plant-based diet. The hope, many more people are, many more vegetarians, many more vegans than say 10 years ago. You know, when I first became vegetarian, I was looked at as peculiar. That was <laughs> in the late 1960s. Yes. And then I would say 10 years ago, you were looked at as weird if you became a, a vegan. But yes. now, and you know, really good vegan cooking, as you know, is just the best and makes you feel good. So anyway, yeah. we've, we've got to think about our unsustainable lifestyle. And then secondly, we've got to alleviate poverty because if you're really poor, you're going to harm the environment, cut down the trees, you're desperate to grow food, to get more land, your population is growing and you're going to hunt animals because you've got to eat or you're going to buy the cheapest junk food in a city in order to survive, you can't ask like, like we can, did it harm the environment? Was it cruel to animals? Is it cheap because of unfair wages? Um, you just have to buy the cheapest to survive. And then we have to at least think about the growth of our populations because there's, I think it's 7.7 .7 or even 7.9 billion of us today. And already we're using up finite natural resources too fast some places faster than nature can replenish them and by 2050 uh, if we're still around it's estimated there'll be closer to 10 billion of us so what's going to happen hmm. so based on what you said you know it's quite true this idea of moving to a, a plant base it's not just an ethical issue although it is one because uh, uh, you know, there have been an evaluation of how many Homo, Homo sapiens ever lived on Earth. Because you know, as you know, 10, 12,000 years ago, we were about 5 million, no big deal. So basically it's about 110 billion. So this is the number of sea and land animal we kill every two months as if nothing happens. So that's an ethical issue. The second one, as you mentioned, that the whole chain from you know, shipping a, a billion, I mean, um, a billion ton of, uh, of grain 
uh, from the poor country South America and, and Africa to the rich country to produce meat, which is a reverse protein factory and could feed a million, a billion people. And it's the second, the whole thing with deforestation, monoculture, methane emission, all this stuff is the second cause of greenhouse gas emission. And it's quite paradoxical that one of the things that was adopted at the COP26 is to reduce methane. At the same time, European Union said we should promote consumption of meat. <laughs> so what's, how can that happen? Meat is the principal. I mean, you cannot do anything about permafrost, but you could certainly reduce meat consumption. And as you said, the injustice, because an Amer average American citizen emit two ta 200 times more CO2 than a Zambian. And at Qatari, 2,000 more times than in Afghani. So unless we balance all that, it's no way. So we, we must have the more social environmental justice. And you cannot blame a mother in Africa that needs to feed her kids. It's the overconsumption of the rich country, the crisis of luxury mm -hmm. that causes all that. Yeah, and added to that, which I know is something else very dear to your heart, we have to remember that every one of those billions of animals in factory farms is a sentient being with a personality capable of feeling fear, terror, pain. You know, Mathieu, way back in the very late 1960s, when I stopped eating meat, although I was still on to eggs and, and uh, milk, but stopped eating meat, why? Because I read about factory farms in the book by Peter Singer yes. uh, called Animal Liberation. I didn't know about factory yes. farms. I was in Gombe. I mean, when I left the UK, there weren't any in the UK. So the next time I looked at a piece of meat on my plate, I thought, this is symbolic of fear, pain, death. Yes. Well, if you think of it like that, do you want that inside you? Fear, pain, death? No, thank you. And then, you know, more recently, learning about the horror for the, um, for the dairy cattle and the chickens, you know, then you feel, no, no, I don't. It's, it's difficult to be a pure vegan if you're traveling the world, but at least you can do your best. Yes. Yes, those, those factories are like hell for for chicken and everything. I mean, this is unbelievable that we came to such extreme. No, and, uh, you know, the Cambridge Declaration of Consciousness will gather some of the greatest neuroscientists in the world. And they say, of course, if we have consciousness, evolution is very economical. It doesn't do things just one species. That means we all have it in different ways. Even pigeons you know, can recognize different paintings if you train them. You know that Bonobo from the work of uh, Matsuzawa are better at mental calculation than uh, young students. <laughs> so there's no, there's no doubt. There's no question. But yeah. still, there's such a prejudice. <clears throat> I remember there's a scientist, a specialist of consciousness in Belgium called Stephen Lores. He's a fa famous for the studying coma. So we did an evening conference on animal and human consciousness. Because we say animal consciousness, the rector of the academia there of the university said, you can't have posters in the university because people who are against animal experimentation are going to go berserk and all that. So it's like, we are so sort of archaic way of thinking. So we should really know that they are sentient beings, that's it. So then we should adjust our ethical behavior according to that. Yeah, we definitely, definitely should. You know, and I mean, this this thing about animal intelligence, oh, it used to be, oh, well, yes, maybe chimpanzees and elephants and whales, but but now we know crows. Crows are so smart, in many ways smarter than chimps. And then, have you seen my octopus teacher? That <laughs> not, of Oscar? The not, intelligence of octopus is something engaging many, many scientific minds. And you know, when I was sent to Cambridge by Lewis Leakey in 1961 or two, I can't remember, I hadn't been to college. I hadn't learned to be a scientist. I was just, you know, a naturalist. I'd been with the chimps two years. And to my amazement, to my shock, to my horror, I was told, 
you can't talk about chimpanzees having personalities or <laughs> minds or emotions. Those are unique to us. You can't talk, you can't have empathy with your subject. You've got to be objective and you can't be objective if you have empathy. Unfortunately, <laughs> when I was a child, I had a fantastic teacher and uh, he's up here behind me on the shelf, it was my dog, Rusty. And if you share your life in a meaningful way with a dog, a cat, a bird, anything, then you know perfectly well the professors were wrong. And finally, and thanks to chimps, actually, because they're, you know, we share 98.6 or 7% of our DNA with them. Uh, thanks to them and the film that my husband was taking of the chimp behavior, tool using, kissing, embracing, holding hands and all the rest of it, science gradually had to change it never admitted it was wrong it just gradually changed and today as i say we're now studying animal sentience emotions and especially intelligence so there has been big change and all of these things but to pick up what you were saying about the scientific research the research in the in the um pharmaceutical and medical research there are companies now, and I know one, and they say it's the best, and it's called um, Vivodyne. And it's got uh, on, on a little computer chip this big, it can create models of human tissue, cells, organs, and it conducts thousands of tests in five minutes. And this is human tissue. And that's much better for, for us, medical, and it's cheaper than all these poor animals who are suffering. And they're suffering monkeys by the thousand now because of this pandemic. Yes, it's terrible. You know, you, oh, sorry. just one thing. Everyone knows that, you know, you were the first one to discover that chimpanzee can make tools and that was a revolution in the field. But you know as well, also you spoke of crowds, that Caledonian crowd, I mean, humans can make tools about 30,000 years ago, right? Something like that. I mean, that this is what people think. But Caledonian crowds are making hooks. Yes. Not only they use it, but they actually fashion them. Yeah. Uh, and they used to go under the bark and take some insect and they keep it at night in their nest and then they use it again the next day. So <laughs> if crowds can use tools, then, you know, we are quite far in the use of intelligence. Many animals. And, you know, um, actually, people say, oh, Jane was the first to discover chimps use tools. Well, if you'd gone into the dark forest of Africa, the pygmy people would have said, oh, we know about chimps. Yes, tools. of course. They demonstrate it. You know, it's just that we in the West are so flippin' arrogant. Yeah, what we call discoveries, and we Western people find something, but people... <laughs> new forever <laughs> yeah it's new then but and you know we haven't listened to the wisdom of the indigenous people we're beginning to now but um yes we're beginning you, to now you might know sabina Kreef, who works in i think uganda she has found that chimpanzee can recognize 250 different plants some are edible some are medicinal and even uh, bush people observe them to find out about some medicinal plants. It's quite amazing. Yep, it is. I know. <laughs> shared knowledge between animals and people about medicinal, the uses of medicinal plants. I, yeah. <clears throat> but, you know, talking about hope, um, hope, hope, it, I, I find it's amazing that places we have absolutely destroyed give nature a chance and nature will reclaim and we may need to give nature i'm <clears throat> sorry a helping hand if if it's been too destroyed but you must have seen places where nature's taking over from cement and and all the nasty things we do to her animals oh, for, on the brink yeah. of extinction given another chance when since most of the commercial whaling stop fortunately whales are coming back. And I've heard a very uh, troubling example of Chernobyl, you know, all around Chernobyl, the huge area has been declared a no man's land. They said there's a huge, incredible 
uh, revival of all wildlife in that. Of course, they may not be in very good health, who knows? But that shows that if you somehow leave those alone, uh, they manage. So this brings me to ask you a, a, your opinion. Maybe you heard about this uh, book called Zoopolis by Sue Donaldson and Kim, Kim Leakey, these are Canadians, and about the rights of animals. They said the right of wild animals, we should treat them like a nation. We don't have a duty to intervene when the lion eats the antelope, but we should we respect as we respect a foreign nation by respecting their environment, that's like, like Gombe forest, by respecting their livelihood, by respecting what, whatever they do. And we don't have right to encroach and destroy their natural habitat. So that seems to be a very interesting way to deal with animal rights related to wild species. Because in France, according to the law, wild animals are called res nullus, which is in Latin means something that has no value. That means anyone can own them, basically. It's completely crazy that mostly the hunters can own them. So, yeah. but in fact, we should respect them as a, as a kind of nation, their territory as a foreign nation in somehow so that they can continue to thrive. So what, how do you feel about this idea? Yeah, well, I think it's, it's a good idea. And uh, I think a lot of nature needs something like rights. I think New Zealand was the first country to give a river rights. Yes. So yes. They gave a, and just last week in Ecuador, there was a huge win. There was a big Canadian oil company and it wanted to have permission to drill in, I don't know how big the area was, but a huge area. And they lost the case because the first country in the world to give rights to the natural world, nature had rights. Mm -hmm. And if that spreads, you know, that's going to save forests and, and all sorts of things. Because <clears throat> by destroying forests and polluting the ocean, we're harming the two great lungs of the world and so there is this big move now, planting trees. And um, I know that our youth program, Roots and Shoots, around the world, well, we're in 65 countries. And between the young people, they planted literally millions of trees. Hmm. Uh, Manu, you have something? Yes, um, Jane, you mentioned uh, in your book the necessity to create a new social contract between humans and the living world. And so you kind of already gave some answers about that, but what do you exactly imagine uh, this social contract could look like? Well, I didn't call it a, a social contract. I said we need a new relationship with the natural world. And we've just been talking about this. This is like, give the natural world rights. So we don't have the right to go and cut down trees. Uh, we don't have the right to go and hunt animals. We don't have the right to do uh, things which will pollute the rivers. But the problem is that whereas every sane, rational person understands this, while you have government leaders moving towards the far right, moving towards uh, situations where they get absolute control, then it's going to take a huge amount of citizen speaking out. And in some countries, if they do that, they're going to be put in prison or killed. So we, we, that's, that's what we're up against. If we mm -hmm. were a world of rational people, then these rights would have been given to nature long ago. Jen, what is your reading of the COP26? Because, uh, you know, there have been plus and minus, and uh, even the one who was the head of it was in tears at the end. So how do you well, feel about that? <laughs> my feeling is, if, big IF, if all the commitments and all the promises and all the pledges that were made were followed through, it would have been a huge success. Hmm. But I sit on the fence. Will they be? I mean, we've had all these cops going back to the Paris Accord and mostly all the pledges that have been made have not been kept. Yes. So, you know, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. <laughs> so you see, Winston Churchill for once did, said something quite wise. He says, 
It says state men think of future generation, political men, people thinks about next election. So the problem is the measures that would really make a difference would be quite unpopular in a way. Yeah. Uh, so no one wants to do that because <laughs> they will lose their, you know, on the on the opinion polls. So we would need uh, someone who has the guts of saying, well, I don't care not being reelected, I will do the right thing. Otherwise they pass the baby to the next. And so that's why they say 2030, 2050. <laughs> so, the, so yeah. the future doesn't hurt, but it's going to hurt, not yet, it's going to hurt very hard, but it's not right now. That's, that's one of the issues. So yeah. someone was saying we should somehow bring politicians to take short-term decision because that within their sort of time and also the way to motivate people i, I heard of someone who was a, a environmental scientist in texas now there's the last place you want to be as an environmental scientist so yeah. they all this they say you know we don't believe in anything in climate change they said well Let's talk about the rivers, you know, the Colorado, all the rivers that are getting dry. So, oh yes, there's a big problem with the rivers. So then you bring them to do something for something that affects them, no matter what they think about climate change is a fluke. So I think short-term commitments and what people really experience, then we can sort of move things. Yeah, I, there's an awful lot of barriers to overcome. You know how I see it this hope business, like we know the world's in a mess and nobody can deny that. And, you know, we're told think globally, act locally, but if you think globally, you're going to be depressed. There's no question. So when, when people say, Jane, you can't really have hope. And I say, well, it depends how you define hope. Now I see our world right now as a, we're in a, we're in a dark tunnel and right at the end of that tunnel, is a little star of light. That's hope. But we don't just sit and say, oh, I, I hope that, that that light will come to us. No, we have to roll up our sleeves and we have to crawl under, climb over, work our way around all the obstacles between us and that light. So for me, hope is about action. And for me, hope leads to action. Because if you're hopeful that you can do something to make a difference, um, then you do it. And you know, the lucky thing is when we do something and make a difference, it makes us feel good. Mm -hmm. And therefore you want to do more because you want to feel better. Yes. And the more you do, the more you inspire other people. I want to feel good too. Oh, let me do that. <laughs> yes. No, well, you doing that, I'm going to do this and I'm going to feel good too. And so it spreads like a, like a virus. <laughs> <laughs> the good one. Fast. <laughs> you, you know, in Sanskrit, karuna means compassion. Oh, yeah. So, so we need more karuna virus, not corona one. <laughs> <laughs> Mathieu, uh, you often mention one virus that spreads a lot, which is altruism. And you mention yes. it as a, maybe a solution for the climate crisis. Maybe you can elaborate. Yes, but just before going to altruism, I want to... Uh, compare, I mean, bring another notion that's very close to hope is the notion of wonderment. You know, if you are in awe in the front of the beauty of the unspoiled world, the beauty of animals, the beauty of a chimp looking in your eyes, hugging you, what causes you wonderment? Of course, bring respect. You are not going to destroy beautiful natural forest, destroy the habitat of beautiful living beings. So, Wonderment brings the idea of, of respect and respect being concern. And then concern links to action. So yeah. in a way, it's a constructive. Hope is constructive, give you a, a sense of elevation. Wonderment also. So it counteracts, you know, we know very well that so many environmental activists and scientists are very uh, prone to depression because they know what should be done. Nobody does it, so it's very depressing. So wonderment and hope are very good. Now, I may just say one thing about the wrong kind of hope, that easygoing hope is to say, okay, in 30 years, don't worry, 
they will find some te technological way. They will send some particles in the atmosphere that will cool down the climate. So no, but no need to bother. So that's that's not a real hope. That's just a easy escape, isn't it? There's an escapism. Yes. <laughs> so just to say a few words about altruism, you know, just like hope, it may feel goody goody, you know, utopian. How you have can hope when the situation is so terrible? How can you be altruistic when everybody likes to be selfish? But if you look at the main challenges of our times, you know, we have the short-term challenges, like a mother in Africa needed to feed her kids tomorrow. Then there's the midterm. Everyone wants to you know, flourish in life, like the roots and shoots. You empower people so that they can have a good life. And then there's a the long term, which is the sake of many, many future generations and 8 million other species who are co-citizens in this world. So now you want to bring around the same table people like you, you know, short, act, social activists, politicians, economists, uh, uh, environmental scientists, and then discuss about building a better world, assuming that everybody wants to do that. So selfishness not going to do the job. Short-term interest, you know, economy, Society at the service of economy, that's not going to work. And, and, if, you, and if you say, like I heard this American billionaire on Fox News about the rise of the ocean, saying, I find absurd to change my behavior now for something happening in 100 years. So this is crazy. So selfishness, not good the job. Now, altruism may seem utopian, but it's the only pragmatical, pragmatic uh, answer having more consideration for others, you will take care of the Af African mother who needs to feed her child. You will remedy to extreme poverty. In the midterm, you will do something about the workplace, about everything that people can flourish in life, their, their natural aspiration to thrive. And in the long term, if you really care for future generation, you will do what's needed so that they don't say you knew and you did nothing. Or like Greta Thunberg says, it's a treason. So altruism is actually the only the thread that can reconcile the needs for those three timescales. And it's very pragmatic, just like hope and wonderment, they, they, come, they go together. Yeah, they go together. And um, <sighs> I mean, you know, the sad thing is we know what needs to be done. We know that if we do what needs to be done, we can slow down climate change, we can slow down the loss of biodiversity, but the will to do it is yeah. maybe building with people, but it's not building at the, well, actually, there's one, one more bit of good news, hopeful news, and that is some of the biggest corporations are beginning to, to change. And there was one lovely story. I was talking to the CEO of a, a very big international corporation about three weeks ago. And he said, Jane, for the past eight years, I've been really working to get my company uh, to have more ethical, social and environmental um, program, you know, along the supply chain, place where the product comes from. And he said there were three reasons. One, I saw the writing on the wall. I saw that if, if my company goes on using these finite natural resources at the rate that it is, then I, I'm finished. Secondly, consumer pressure. More and more people are beginning to demand products that are ethical. But then he said, what really got to me was my little girl. About eight years ago, she came home from school. She was 10 years old, I think. And she said, Daddy, they're telling me that what you're doing is hurting the planet. Daddy, that isn't true, is it? Because it's my planet. And he said, that got to me. <laughs> so this is why I have such hope in youth. Because yes. you know, young people, they're so pure to start with. And they, they, they don't understand this harm. And you know, you talked about wonder, which I think is incredibly important. And we must reconnect with the natural world. And we need schools to push for outdoor education, especially yes. with very young children, so that they get this sense of wonder. And, you know, the, the other day, uh, there was a little boy of about three, I think, and he was watching this snail 
you know how snails just kind of go along uh, with <laughs> that. And he was staring at this snail. And he was obviously wondering, well, how is it moving? And so he suddenly picked it up, put it on the window, ran inside and looked at it from underneath. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's, he, he was filled with wonder. And if you yeah. then get curious and you then start to understand, then you learn to love and what you love, as you say, you will protect. You know, if children don't even know the name of birds and trees, how could they feel to protect them? So you know right, about the concept of biophilia, that we have naturally an affinity for other species, for the natural world. There was a very troubling study in the Lancet. Children who grew almost exclusively in cities, they are 25% higher risk of having depression and schizophrenia. Yeah. This is amazing. And yeah. then children who are often nature classes, who are taken in the nature, they found that they have much higher creativity because they see, as you say, for the snail, they see how nature does it. They see how nature is interdependent. They see how nature solves problems. So their whole sort of creativity unfold by seeing the extraordinary creativity and interdependence, interconnection of the natural world, which you don't find in the great environment. Yeah, well, it was in Japan where they first invented the term forest bathing. And when I first heard it, I thought, what do they do, put on swimming costumes and go in the forest? But of course, now, even in Canada, doctors are prescribing for slightly neurotic people, go and spend time in nature. They're prescribing it on a thing. Um, and, and a study that I loved was done in Chicago and they took two areas of high crime both you know inner city yes. and one of those areas they planted trees and plants and did, made it as green as they could and the crime level dropped wow and yes and so of course they quickly did and so urban tree planting i think is really really important like urban farming a lot of people yeah. now in cities are growing food up on their rooftops mm. and you know food in school gardens and Anyway, I get back to children again and again and again, because once they understand the problems and we empower them to take action and help them, they're changing the world. Do you know Roots and Shoots is now in 65 countries? Oh, that's wonderful. And we have members in kindergarten. We even have a few little preschoolers, but kindergarten many and university many and everything in between. And they're all choosing for themselves three projects, one to help people, one to help animals, one to help the environment. Yeah. And somehow, building out of that without us teaching them, we try to bring different cultures together, usually virtually. Mm. And they're learning to understand that much more important than the color of your skin, your culture, your language, your religion, is the fact that we're all human beings. So what comes out of this and you've said it yourself just a little while ago, and it's, to me, the most important word, respect. Respect for each other, respect for animals, respect for nature. Mm. And, you know, the golden rule common to every single of course. religion. Yeah, well, do to If others. we were just applying the golden rule, the world would be such a better place. <laughs> yeah, but think what the world would be like if we all obeyed the golden rule. And you know, you spoke about Chicago. There was also another troubling study. When you ask kids uh, about where the meat come from, more than half said, well, from the supermarket. Yeah. Then before that, where? Well, the factory. Yeah. And then they didn't make the connection with the animal on four legs. No. So just to come back to the, how hard it is to motivate people. Isn't it because emotion, evolution equipped us with emotion to react to immediate danger? If I say the house is getting in fire, we all rush. If we say the house is getting in fire in 30 years, say, okay, we'll see. So it is natural because uh, no, in the forest it's immediate danger. You don't think about danger in 30 years. So how to, to, of, to, to hope, to wonder, to all those factors, how to really motivate people for something that is 10, 20, 30 years. Because 
you know, the urgency of the climate is we have about 10 years to prevent the many, many tipping points to tip together from the Amazonian forest to the Arctic to the, if they tip together, then there will further tipping points. So there's really something we cannot go back. So how, how to motivate people enough when it's, it's starting to hit on their skin, but not quite enough to really become preoccupation number one. So how can we do that? What do you think? <laughs> I come back to children again, because children don't think in the future. Children think about now. Yes. And children are in influencing their parents and grandparents. And in some cases, like the case I told you, they're making change. Yes. And all of these Roots and Shoots groups, I mean, I was just on a Zoom before this, and mm. there was one of our Roots and Shoots youth leaders and she was saying, you know, what Roots and Shoots, how it had changed her, how it made her think more respectfully about the people around her, how she's working on discrimination, how she's developed compassion. So she's working with her group to get food parcels for Christmas for, for all the poor people in the area and raising money for food banks and things like that. So, and this is happening in 65 countries. Hmm. And you could help a lot, Mattia. You could help us grow. Yes, <laughs> we're ready. In your world, because that's how we grow. We grow by collaboration. Yes. And you know, you said about that little boy and that CEO of that big company. I think well, that's one of the reasons why people like Greta has such an impact. Because somehow it's so in the right. I mean, she's sought in the truth that adults feel embarrassed. They start to feel ashamed. There's no way we can continue like that. And they start to feel it, that the, the critical mass is going to turn and the cultural change is going to happen and they're going to be left you know, as uh, some kind of unethical people. And it's time to change. So this is something they're very profound and encouraging that's happening. Thank you. Thank you both so much for this conversation. It, it is so inspiring and we actually have lots of questions in the chat, but unfortunately we won't have time to take them. Um, thank you, Jane, for the wonderful work that you're doing uh, with the Jane Goodall Institute. And so I actually invited Galit. Uh, if, you, if we have a few minutes, Galit is um, uh, the director of the Jane Goodall Institute France. And I wanted to know if she maybe wanted to talk a bit about uh, the Institute's work. So Galit, are you here? Um, yes, I'm with you, Manon. Uh, thank you so much once again, Jane and Mathieu, for this amazing conversation. Uh, listening to you both is very inspiring. And, uh, and I know that from Karuna Session point of view and from Jane Goodall Institute, we're receiving tons of questions. Um, I just wanted to say to everyone that uh, in order to... Uh, that Jane blazed the trail for us and uh, as a global community conservation organization uh, that advanced her vision and work, uh, we would be really delighted to answer to any questions that you people have. So do not hesitate to contact us, Eva Karuna Session or herself in order to do so. And uh, the work that uh, uh, Karuna is doing on the field is so impressive. And I think that on our little level also, the Jane Goodall Institute has a lot of impacts uh, and with the youth and also on the field with the association, with the wildlife protection, with the human collaboration and um, it's a real pleasure to collaborate with your organization thank you again Mathieu and thank you again to all your wonderful team all the time Jane I have one wish you had a wonderful rich extraordinary life but please be with us for many more years we need you <laughs> please be patient <laughs> with this planet Okay, same to you. Okay, okay we'll, we'll be there. What's the magic elixir that's going to keep us both alive forever? I think wonder and hope is good. All right, wonder and hope. That's do. And respect, respect. And benevolence and benevolence and respect. Okay, let's have those four and we will live very long. Yeah, we'll live very long. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you.
90, Matthew. I'm nearly 90. That's not bad, is it? My mother's 98 and she's still going on, so don't worry. <laughs> yes, it's very good. Not Wonderful. Bad. Go yeah. on. <laughs> Go on. Anyway, lovely talking to you again. Let's stay in touch. Yes, please, by all means. Yeah. This was wonderful to reconnect. Uh, absolutely Hi. super. Thank Have you. a good night, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the live, and I'll end it right now. Have a good night. Bye. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. So lovely. Thank you.